Welcome everyone to our Ada J Author new user webinar. This is Jessica Frank with Ada J Author. I'm the project manager. So as you know, each month I like to do a tip for authoring. Um, and my tip for authoring this month is that if you are new to authoring or if you feel like you need a refresher, I am doing a online training series with Law Help Interactive and Capstone Practice Solutions that begins on August 28th. And we're going to cover how to create interviews in Hot Docs in A to J Author, how to create hot, create hot Docs templates and A to J templates. So it's not only a great review, it's also good for those of you who have never done any document assembly um, before. To learn more, you can sign up at probono.net slash DA support slash trainings. And the series will run for eight weeks. It's once a week on Tuesdays and we have it as a flipped classroom model. So you watch the video that we prepared ahead of time, and then you do the homework assignment that goes along with the video, the, the skill that you're learning during that class time. And then when we have the, the sessions during the week, we meet to discuss um, problems that you might have had with the video or with the training, um, any issues with the homework and general questions that you have about the software itself. So uh, the flipped classroom model lets you get um, more people into our training series rather than having to come and do a two day intensive, which we also do um, before the uh, ITC conference, which will be in January in New, New Orleans. So we do, if you can't make this online training series, you can always watch the videos later or follow along with the homework in your own time, or you can attend the two day in-person training um, in the in the winter. So our agenda is pretty packed today. This is um, more intensive than I usually do for a standard uh, A to J author new user webinar, but we're going to cover two major topics in A to J. So the first one is repeat loops. We're going to talk about what repeat loops are, two ways to create repeat loops in A to J author, and then how the variables work within a repeat loop. And then our second topic, which is the most advanced topic that you're ever going to have to cover in A to J. So if it seems pretty complicated when we're going through it, just know that this is um, as bad as it gets in terms of creating uh, document assembly with A to J. So we're going to talk about nested repeat loops, what the problem is, what the solution is, and then the two components, the A to J guided interview portion and the hot docs template portion. Again, if at any time you have questions, feel free to raise your hand and I'll keep an eye on uh, the go-to meeting panel, or you can put your questions or comments in the question box as well. So the first topic to talk about today is repeat loops. What is a repeat loop? So a repeat loop, also known as a repeat dialogue, is a series of questions that will be displayed to the end user multiple times based upon that user's input. You want to use a repeat loop if you want to gather the same type of information several times. So instead of creating uh, 50 questions, you really can create just the five questions in a repeat loop and ask them 10 times if need, need be. Repeat loops are used, for example, when you want to gather information about a child. Um, your user may have multiple children, but you need the same information about each child, like the child's name, their birth date, their biological father, and what school they go to. That same information needs to be collected multiple times. And so you create the repeat loop or the repeat dialogue that asks that uh, however many times the end user needs to see it. There are two ways in A to J to do a repeat loop, and they both have the same outcome. You can either collect the number or the items first, so the user tells you how many times they have to go through the loop, or you can ask if there are any more items or people or things to add at the end of the loop. So collect the number first or ask to add more are the two ways in A to J to do repeat loops. The first one we're going to cover is collecting the number first. You use this when the end user is likely to know right away how many times they need to go through the loop. And so you ask them for the number up front. You gather that value in a variable. Here the variable uh, behind this list one through nine is uh, number of children and you. So this is very commonly used with children um, and information you need about the children because the end user should know right away how many children they have. Um, when it's a finite list, a small list, they'll generally know the question. They'll generally be able to answer the question of how many up front. There are seven steps under the collecting the number first way of uh, creating a repeat loop in A to J. 
the first step is to create the set, the set of questions that you want to repeat. So you know that the form needs to know about each child's birth date, their name, their, um, their biological father, and what school they go to. So you create those four questions, format them however you'd like, using the different fields um, or buttons or whatever. So you have the four questions that you're going to ask your end user over and over again. That's step one. Step two is to create a counting variable. The counting variable is the tool that A to J and Hot Docs use to keep track of how many times a user has gone through a set of questions. In A to J, this needs to be a number on the variables tab. If you look at the red arrow at the bottom, my counting variable for this example is child count. Um, you'll notice that it looks different than the other variables in that it doesn't follow the naming conventions that we generally have set up with capitalizing the first letter of the first word and every other letter has lowercase and then the two letter indicator of what type it is at the end. This one is just child and count smushed together one word, no two letter indicator. This is the clue to me as the author that this is a counting variable. So the third step in collecting the number first is to create a how many question. So how many children do you have with a drop down list to let them pick one through nine? Um, it is the first question of your repeat dialogue, but it is not one that will be repeated to your end user. So every time they go through the loop, they're not going to have to say how many children they have. This question is not repeated. It is the jumping off point for the repeat dialogue. Step four on that how many question, you need to initialize the count. So you have to tell A to J that you are starting them into a repeat loop. They're going into the loop that has the counting variables, child count. So on the buttons tab under the continue button, the repeat option, you change it from normal to set counting variable to one that initializes the counting variable and you tell A to J what counting variable it is. So it's child count here. I have a question, so I'm just gonna pop out the question panel. So the question is, is there a way to increase the maximum number in the drop-down list? Yes, in the drop-down list on uh, this example here, I have set to one to nine. Um, it was a scope for me when I created this. This is obviously a demo, but um, in terms of guided interviews, you as the author can set the scope of who you can help. The idea behind document assembly packages is that um, it helps most people. Some people are still gonna need that, that legal aid attorney or or the private attorney to help them complete their process. So um, I made the decision as the author that if somebody has more than nine children, that they should speak to an attorney. So I would have some sort of uh, logic here or a learn more that says, um, you know, what if I have more than nine children? And I would have a learn more that said, you should contact X legal aid in my state, um, tell them you have 10, you know, 10 plus children, and you'll be um, expedited to the front of the line kind of thing. So this number, the nine, is completely arbitrary here. Um, it was just a scope uh, constraint when I created the interview. You could have as many as you wanted here for them to collect the number. I made this list in A to J um, on the field. I set the minimum as one, the maximum as nine, but it, um, it can be anything. Thank you for your question. So uh, after I have created that jumping off point, that how many question, I've initialized the count, then I can go into my questions that actually want to be repeated. So in my example here, I have child name and child birth date. Those are the two questions that I want repeated to every end, uh, for every child of this end user. So in every question that is to be repeated, I need to tell A to J that this is part of a repeat loop. And how I do that is in the question text section, I include the counting variable child count here. I do not identify the counting variable on that on the question design editor of the how many question. So I don't tell A to J that the how many question is part of the loop, just the questions that are actually to be repeated over and over again. You can see here on the screenshot of the map, in this yellow question column, I have my how many children question, and it has a number pick. They're gonna pick from a list. It does not have the symbol for the repeat loop, which is this, uh, if you look at the left-hand sign, I blown it up, I've blown it up. Uh, it's a circle arrow and it says the word loop. That indicates the question is part of a loop. Um, so child's name and child's birth date are both in the loop and how many children are not part of the loop because that's only asked to the end user one time. 
Step six in collecting number first is on the last question to be repeated, you have to increment the counting variable. So on the button, you can see this is the continue button, the repeat option changes from normal to increment counting variable, and you tell A to J what counting variable it is by putting child count in there. So when the user presses the continue button on this question, the counting variables number will be increased by one. I use that information in logic on that same question. So on the advanced, uh, on the last question in the logic section, so the same question that this uh, continue button is information is being used. You scroll down into the after section. I have logic that tests whether child count, so the counting variable, equals the number of children they've told me. So if they've told me they have two children and child count is two, then I'm going, so this condition is true. I'm gonna go to the one dash do you have any, which is the next series of questions outside the loop. Otherwise, if they have not gone through the child count enough times, so it does not equal the number of children, they're gonna be taken back into the loop and asked again for the child's name and child's birthday. Sorry about that. So this condition, um, this is just a very simple logic statement that is testing if the end user has gone through the number of, uh, gone through the loop the number of times they said they needed to go. If they have, branch them out of the loop. If they have not, go back into the loop and run through it again. So the second way to create repeat loops in A to J author is to ask to add more at the end. So if the end user is likely to not know how many times they need to go through the loop, you can ask them at the end of the loop if they wanna go through again. So for example, the one I use here is assets. People are not likely to know how many assets over $100 they have until they start building the list and so, until they start going through it and thinking about all of the things like, yes, add another one, yes, add another one, yes, add another one. So this way, of uh, creating repeat loops. Same thing, step one, you create the set of questions that are gonna repeat. You create step two and you create the counting variable. Here my counting variable is asset count. I create a question that leads into the loop but is not part of the loop. This is the same as the um, how many question. This is a do you have any? So if they don't have any assets over $100, they can be branched out of the loop. It doesn't make any sense to uh, ask them questions about assets they don't have or to take them through a loop when they don't need to. But on the yes button, so yes, I have assets over $100, which tells you, yes, I wanna go into the repeat loop. You need to set the counting variable to one in the options section of the buttons tab and uh, the button section, and then add the counting variable of asset count in this example. So this again is initializing the count because the end user has said, yes, I wanna go through the repeat loop. So I initialize the count of asset count and on every question that is part of the, uh, the loop here, asset name, asset value are my two questions. I identify that it is part of the loop in the question section of the uh, page and add the asset count to that. Again, it's not on the, do you have any question? Because that's not part of the loop, it's only asked one time. It's only on every question to be repeated. Oh, excuse me, I have asset name and then do you have any more? So those are the two questions of my loop. They, I know they're part of the loop on the map because this purple column of questions has the circle arrow uh, for asset name and any more, but not for do you have any. Step five, on the last question to be repeated, there's two different paths for uh, the yes and the no button. So you always need a question at the very end of the uh, column of questions in the repeat loop that asks the end user if they want to add any more. This is where the end user says, yes, I wanna go back into the loop or no, I'm done, I can move on. So the question is, do you have another asset over $100 to add? If yes, I wanna increment the counting variable on the yes button and tell A to J that it's part of the asset count. So it increments the uh, asset count uh, by one, it adds one more to the count. So I know that they've gone through, that they're ready to go through it a second time. On the no button, it's completely normal. They're, uh, you don't need to do any repeat options. They're ready to move out of the repeat loop. So you just branch them normally onto whatever the next set of questions is for your end user. So variables in a repeat dialog are in questions that are repeated are treated the same as any other variable 
that you use in any other type of, of question. You can use them the same different fields. You can put button uh, variables behind buttons. You can ask the end user to input radio buttons, checkboxes, text fields, date, gender, all that can be used in a repeat loop. I have a question. Let me check that. Um, so the question is, does the second type, the asking to add more at the end, always have to begin with a yes, no question? Can a repeat loop begin after a continue page? It could. Um, I added the do you have any at the beginning question because my end user could potentially not have any assets to talk about and they should be branched out of the loop, but there's no reason that it couldn't just start with a continue. Um, it can. It, all it has to do on that continue button then before it goes into the loop, you have to initialize the count by using um, set counting variable to one and giving A to J the counting variable when you um, on the button section. So it doesn't have to be a yes, no. I just did it um, to allow my end user to leave um, or not go through the repeat loop if I didn't, if they didn't need to. But yes, you can start it with any button. So the only difference with variables in a repeat dialog is that any of the variables in the loop itself have to, you have to tell A to J that this variable can accept multiple values. So normally, if this checkbox here is not checked, what A to J is going to do is if you had the end user go through the loop once and fill out information about their child, Allison, and then I go through the loop again and fill out information about Benjamin, it's going to override, overwrite all of Allison's information with Benjamin's information. But if this checkbox is checked uh, in the variable editor under the variables tab, so I'm editing the variable itself, and saying that child name TE can store multiple values, what A to J is gonna do is gonna store Allison and then Benjamin instead of overriding Allison with Benjamin. Um, so you, if you're troubleshooting your repeat loops and you keep seeing that it, the same answer that you gave in the last iteration of the loop is showing up again when you go through the second time, it's because your variable isn't set to store multiple values. Once you change that, A to J will allow for multiple values within one variable. What A to J is doing is it's essentially creating an index of uh, all the values stored here. So if you look in my, uh, I have my script here in my variables tab open from preview with a screenshot, and I have child last name one is Frank, child last name two is Frank, child middle name one is Catherine, child middle name two is Elizabeth. You can see first name one is Allison, second name, uh, second first name is Madison. Um, so you can see that A to J is creating an index of the variables um, because I'm telling it to allow multiple values to be stored. The only difference with repeat loop questions themselves is that you need to identify that they are part of the loop by including this counting variable in the question itself. So what the screenshot is, is of the question design editor. I scrolled down a little bit from the where you enter the text of your question. This is the learn more section, learn more audio, and then counting variable is underneath the, the audio for the learn more. Because A to J is, is indexing all of the answers in a variable that has multiple values, um, you can show all of the values for that um, in a learn more, and A to J will automatically put in the and or the comma based on the number of uh, values held. So you could use this on that, do you have another asset over $100 to add? And you can have a learn more that says, what assets have I told you about already? And if the end user, end user is going through it and they've created um, you know, 10 things in the list, they might not remember what they said eight things ago. Um, so give them the things that they've already told you about. So you can literally say to the end user, you've told me about your and you use a macro here at the bottom to call out all the values held by asset name T. And what will display to the end user is you told me about your house and car. Next time they go through it, it'll say you told me about your house, comma, car, and jet ski. And then as they keep adding things, it'll keep adding the commas in uh, to make it proper grammar there for your end user. You can also count, call out just one value held within the variable. So here is a series of questions. I asked first, what was the child's name? And then I wanna ask what the child's date of birth is. But they've already told me the child's name, so I might as well customize it by saying, what is Allison's date of birth? To remind them what child I'm talking about. Or, or four questions later, who is Allison's biological father? Or what school does Allison go to? 
um, particularly if they have multiple children and you're asking multiple questions about each child, you can just make it easy for your end user and tell them which child you're specifically asking for rather than what is your first child's date of birth, what is your second child's date of, date of birth, etc. So I can call out one value um, of the one of the values held by this variable that could potentially contain multiple values by using the macro variable name te so whatever the variable name is pound counting variable so here I want to call out the value of child name first te that corresponds to the iteration of the loop I am in so first time I go through the loop I say my child's name is Allison second time I go through the loop I say my child's name is Benjamin then the second uh, so I want to call out just Allison's date of birth or just Benjamin's name for date of birth. I can call out whatever iteration of the loop I'm in based on this macro. Just a way you don't need you don't need it, but it does make it easier for your end user um, to remember which specific child you're talking about, particularly if there are multiple questions uh, in the loop. So nested repeat loops is our next topic. Again, it is one of the most complicated things that you're gonna have to do as an author in A to J author. Um, and so if this seems deep in the weeds or gets complicated, um, it's complicated for me. It takes every time I have to do nested repeat loops, I have to review the slide deck and I have to practice a couple of times. So um, what I've included with the, the slide deck here today, and it will be included in the training video, is this slide deck and it also the sample guided interview, the sample hot docs template, and the sample, sample hot docs component file so that you can practice the things here with nested repeat loops. And then you can see what I've done um, in the sample to compare um, later on. So um, the link to that will be at the end of this presentation and it will also be in the, uh, the YouTube video as well, a link to it in the description. So note that nested repeat loops are only for use with hot docs templates right now. A to J templates don't currently support nested repeat loops, but we are working to allow for the native support of nested repeat loops in A to J author, both in the interview and the templates itself. So what are nested repeat loops? Before we get into the problem and the solution and how to do it, what are they? So nested repeat loops are when you have a repeat loop within a repeat loop. So the example I'm going to give you is, uh, and what we're going to work through today, is I have a, a question, a loop, that asks about the child's name, the user's child, uh, or children. And then within that loop, each individual child could have lived in multiple cities. So I want to ask about all the cities that specific child has, asked about, has lived in. So I have child's name is the parent or the outer loop. Cities the child has lived in is the inner loop. So for my end user, they could have multiple children and each of those children could have lived in multiple different cities. So I can't just ask for what are all the cities your children have lived in, you know, general blanket statement. Each child could have lived in different multiple cities or different addresses and I need to collect that information. I've seen nested repeat loops most commonly used in divorce interviews when you're trying to get uh, a common question that I've seen on the divorce forums is, uh, list all the, the addresses this child has lived at it for the past five years. And so each child could have lived at different addresses and multiple different addresses over that five-year period. So you have information about child A and all of their addresses, and then child B, which could be the same as child A, but could be different. So you need a different uh, repeat loop inside of child B's information and so on. So the problem uh, is that hot docs, has explicit indexing of two digits. So it has child's name first TE is two, and then child city TE can live under child's name uh, as two comma one. So it knows that it's second loop, first city, or second parent, like second child, first city. Um, but the problem is that A to J only has one digit indexing. It only allows for one counting variable at a time. So we have child first name TE, so the second child, but then I have that part of the hack, which I'll show you, is that we basically have to set child city to 21, which is then parsed out into hot docs into two comma one. So there's both a, a hot docs issue and, uh, and an A to J part that go with it as well. So the solution, which is a workaround from A to J four, 
that was created by Bob Aubin. Bob did a lot of consulting work for many of the states that have very complicated A to J and hot docs templates. Um, and so Bob created this workaround that allows for you to have 21 in A to J for city, city name and that to be parsed into hot docs into two comma one. So again, a lot of this is gonna be deep in the weeds, um, but the purpose of going through this is that you'll have the slide deck and the training video and the samples to work with when you actually have to do this in your interview. So let's talk a little bit about the solution. We have variables in A to J on the left, and we have variables in the middle for hot docs. Um, this is one of the, the only times that you have variables in hot docs that are not going to match necessarily to your variables in A to J, and that's okay because that's where the parser comes in. So in A to J, we have outer count and we have parent counter NU in hot docs. The purpose of both of those variables is to track the outside or the parent loop. We have inner count and child counter NU, which track the inside or the child loops. We have absolute count in A to J and we have explicit index NU, X, X, EXP index NU, which is a unique index for each answer in the child loop. We have array size NU in both, which is the maximum number of answers in any given child loop. And we have ICAP NU, which is the total iterations of any given child loop. This will make more sense as we go along. So like I mentioned, you are gonna have distinct hot docs variables that are not used in the A to J guide interview. Usually when you create a general hot docs template and you have an A to J guide interview as a front end, you use the very same variables from hot docs in your questions for your end user, they fill in those answers and they're just merged into the hot docs template. Here, we're gonna cre create distinct A to J variables and hot docs variables, and a hot docs computation is going to parse and map those A to J variables to the corresponding hot docs variables um, to simulate that explicit two digit indexing. So what we're going to use in the sample and what I'll show you is in A to J author, I'm going to ask them uh, to answer child city TE and then in the computation, I'm gonna parse child city TE into HD child city TE. So hot docs child city TE. So the A to J author component, so I mentioned there's an A to J part and there's a hot docs part. You have to basically set up all of these extra variables to be used in the uh, parsing computation in hot docs. So the last question before you jump into the loop um, and I, I set up my sample to basically like, do you wanna go into the loop or not? Do you wanna add more children? Do you wanna add more cities? I just did this, the asking to add more way. So the last question before the loop, which for me, um, because this is a basic interview, was just the, the three dash gender. You need to set the array size to 10. So I am limiting the maximum number of, of cities the child could have lived in to 10. I do that for a couple of reasons. So just like I limited the number of children that could be answered from one to nine, I only want to allow people to use my interview if they ha if their child has lived in less than 10 cities in whatever my time frame is, um, for two reasons. One is the scope in terms of if they have if their child has been moving around a lot, um, if I'm doing a divorce or a custody or, or some sort of situation that's dependent on where the child has lived and who needs notice and that kind of thing, if they've lived in more than 10 places, you, they probably are gonna need more help than um, just a document assembly package can give them. So I'm only gonna allow people to use this document assembly package if they have less than 10 cities that each individual child has lived in. Um, and if more than 10, I'll give them a warning that says, um, sorry, you've exceeded the maximum, please see uh, legal aid and be put to the front of the line. The second reason beyond scope is that it makes it easier to do the computation for parsing. So um, it starts with 11, one comma one, uh, starts with 11 as the first thing or the first um, city for each child, for the first child, so that when it's parsed, it's one comma one. Second child, um, the array is then times 10. And so the second child's two comma one, 21. And third child is three comma one, 31. It just makes the math easier when you can divide and multiply by 10. So my array is locked to 10, and this is the example Bob had as well, starting with an array size of 10. You also have to initialize the inner count and the outer count. So 
I just showed you how to initialize those on the button tabs when we were in the repeat loop section. Nested repeat loops are more complicated, so I'm going to manually initialize them rather than using the tools built in to author. Um, I'm manually setting them to one in the logic section. As you can see, it's not super complicated logic. You literally could have this screenshot open, type that into your interview, and it would work. The outer loop questions are tagged with the counting variable the same way that you do regular repeat loops. So outer count, every question that's part of the outer loop. In my example, only child's name is part of the outer loop. Um, and do you have any more children? Uh, so those two questions are part of the outer loop. They're both tagged with outer count. On the outer loop, I also have to initialize the counting variable absolute count, which is what I'm going to use for my child loop. Um, absolute count, if you remember, uh, is the number that that um, specific child has gone through that inner loop. So um, this absolute count um, is set to the outer count times the array size plus 10. So the first time outer count is set to 1, array size is 10, so 10 times 1 is 10, and add 1, 11, so absolute count is 11. So the very first child, their very first city is count 11, which will then be parsed into hot docs into 1 comma 1. Next time they go through this, it's going to set the absolute count. Uh, it's going to increment it. I have logic, which I'll show you, that will set absolute count to 12, then 13, then 14. When it gets to the second child, it'll be 21, 22, 23, 24. All gets parsed into the two-digit indexing in hot docs. The other logic on here is I need to set add inside repeat TF to true. So this is a variable that I'm going to use in the logic later on that tests uh, specific conditions. So I need to set it to true here because they, they want to go into the loop. So here on the last question in the outer loop, before I get to the inner loop, this is the same as this is the jumping off point for the inner loop. So has Benjamin lived in multiple cities? If no, then I only have to gather the one city information and they don't have to go through the loop. If yes, they're going to need to go through the loop. Um, so I ask the, en the end user if they need to enter the inner repeat loop. Uh, once they, they say yes, then I take them to a question that asks what city has, what is a city that, that your child has lived in. Um, and on that inner loop, I need to tell A to J what loop it's in. So absolute count is my inner counting variable. And I have to check the nested box. When I check it, I get the option to put what is the outer loop. This is one of the known differences from A to J4 to A to J6. So A to J4, you did not have to tell A to J what the outer loop is in order to make ordinals and um, the navigation work properly with nested repeat loops. In A to J6, you have to explicitly state that this is part of an inner loop, and it is nested within this specific outer loop. On that inner loop, so I only have one question. What is the city they lived in? Type it in, and then they can either add more cities or they can move on. If they want to add more cities, they're saying, I want to go through the loop again. I set add inside repeat TF to true, and I take them back to that uh, the same question. What city do they live in? If they say move on, they're done with the loop. They don't have any more cities to add for this child. I set that same add inside repeat TF to false, and I branch them onto a question that asks if they have any more children to talk about. The logic on this same question, that add more move on question, is the most important part of the A to J part. Um, and it's, it's pretty complicated logic when you first look at it. Again, open the screenshot type it side by side when you're actually doing it, but I'll go through the conditions quickly. Um, so this is if add inside repeat TF times this version of the count. Um, so they've answered, it's testing whether they've answered add more or move on. If they said add more and inner count is less than 10, less than my array size, I wanna set inner count to absolute count minus array size times outer count plus one. So the first time I go through the loop, absolute count is set to 11. What this math then is, is saying set inner count to 11 minus 10 times one. So 10 times one is 10 plus one. So 11 minus 10 
is 1 plus 1. So set inner count to 2. Basically, this is what all this math is saying if you substitute out the actual numbers. Next time it goes through, it would say if absolute count was, um, was 12, then it would be 12 minus 10, which is 2 plus 1, 3. Set inner count to 3. Then I'm telling it if the same condition, so uh, they've said they want to add more and they haven't gone over the array size, I want to increment absolute count. So first I'm going to set inner count, and then I'm incrementing absolute count. So the next time it goes through the loop, it'll be the break count. So I'm just adding 1 to absolute count. If they said they want to go through it again, and the number of times they've gone through it is greater than the array size, um, then I would set the cap to inner count. They've, And then I would also probably branch them to a question that said, I'm sorry, this, this is only for if you have uh, less than 10 children. And then finally, if they've said they don't want to go through the loop anymore, so add inside repeat TF is false, then I wanna set ICAP NU, which will be used in hot docs, to the inner count. Remember, I set inner count up here. So if inner count is two, then ICAP is then set at two, um, and so forth. Again, complicated logic, happy to walk through it on one-on-ones with you guys. Um, and you can always just look at this and kind of copy into your interview itself. I have a question. Um, question about does the nested loop type have to match the outer loop type? Nope. You could have asked to add more on the inside and you can have number of children on the outside. Um, the number of children requires logic, which would happen in uh, to test whether they've met the number of children versus uh, number they said they had to go through versus number of the loop, um, but that would happen on the outside loop. The inner loop can be one type of repeat loop and the outer loop can be a different type of repeat loop. Thank you for that question as well. Okay, so we have the hot, we have the A to J part, which has that logic and setting a bunch of variables in logic and initializing them. Then we have the hot docs component. So what I did is I created a very simple in terms of like, what it's asking for, uh, hot docs template just has this information in it, but it's pretty complex in terms of all the things it's using in hot docs to trigger basically child's name has lived in list of city. Uh, this green is an if else statement. I have a parsing computation. I'll show you all these. I have a repeat loop with a repeat loop inside a repeat loop. Um, so your output is gonna be very simple in the sample, but the how to make it do all of that is pretty complex in hot docs. And it's the complexity, besides the parsing computation, all of this loop within a loop stuff is pretty complex in hot docs. So um, all the A to J is adding is this parsing computation. This is the most important part of the hot doc side is this parsing computation. Again, you can look at the screenshot when you're actually doing it, but what it's doing is very similar to in A to J. It's uh, initializing the count for parent count and child count. It's setting the explicit index to parent count times array size plus one. So same thing I was doing to absolute count. Um, so parent counter would be one, array size is 10, plus one is 11. So explicit index would be like 11, 21, 31, 41, 33, that kind of thing. So while parent count is less than or equal to outer count, which I passed from A to J, and while child count is less than or equal to inner count. So I only want this to run when it's within the parameters that I've said, um, I've set and passed from A to J. I want to set HD child city TE. So that's that hot docs only child city TE. And then this is the two digit indexing. So I wanna set hot docs child city e, TE like one comma one to child city TE, which came from A to J, explicit index, which would be 11. So set hot docs one comma one to A to J 11. Set hot doc city 21 or two comma one to child city two 21. So this is, this is the part that's parsing the one digit, the 21, the 31, the 11, the 51, uh, into one comma one, two comma one, three comma one, et cetera. And then I'm gonna increment the explicit index and increment the uh, child counter, then increment the parent counter, and then reset the child counter to one 
and reset the child, the explicit index to uh, that 11 or 12 or 31 kind of thing. So uh, looks pretty tricky, looks pretty gnarly. I recommend, oops, excuse me. Um, I recommend copying uh, and pasting or copying from my hot docs component file that I'll share with you all into your own when you do this. The other part, the two parts that were read in this example, so the repeat parent or outer loop and repeat child or inner loop, those two are repeats within Hot Docs. Uh, in the parent or outer loop, we have child's name, and I tell Hot Docs that child or inner loop is part of parent loop. So I tell Hot Docs not just that name has to be repeated, but that inner loop is part of, of the, the outer loop as well. The inner loop just contains that Hot Docs child city TE. So the final product is Allie and Benjamin are my two children. They're not really my two children, but, um, and they have lived in Chicago and Pensacola and Pensacola and Tampa. So my final document looks pretty simple. You can see here from the document preview, it's very basic, um, but it does capture everything your end user would need. Um, oftentimes I've seen it in a table situation. I've worked on one um, that was a table based on addresses and who the who they lived with as the petitioner. Um, so if you have a situation that looks like pretty complicated, I have a pretty complicated uh, divorce petition that um, you can look at as a sample as well. So the example files that I have for today are all in this Google Drive. Um, I can copy this link and put it in the chat box as well. Um, one second, let me just put it in the chat for y'all. Um, and so that includes this A to J, the A to J got an interview that I created, the sample answer file that he created that created, um, that created this document. I have the hot docs template, the hot docs component file, and this slide deck are all sitting in this Google Drive folder that you can download and use to test for yourself. If you have any questions, as always, feel free to email me, jessica at cali.org or you can ask your questions now and I can unmute you or answer them from the chat box. And our next webinar is uh, September 6th, the first Thursday of September at 11 a.m. Central. So if you do have questions, feel free to raise your hand or um, to put them in the question box as well. Okay, so there's a question that if um, more than one child lived at the same place, is there an easy way to copy and paste that first child's address into the others? Or is there a way to say all same up front? Yeah, you could have a path um, that asks your end user. Um, I would probably do it as a series of potentially three, three paths. Um, so a question like, have your children all lived at the same address for the last five years? Like if yes, branch them completely um, past the loop to a question that just asks for that one address or those that one uh, series of, you could branch them into a repeat loop that just asks about the address for all the children. Instead of going into the nested repeat loop, um, you could ask if they all lived at like one address, you could just gather that one address and add it to um, the child city ones. Um, yeah, so you could do, you could add, you have to ask the end user though an extra question though that asks, have they all lived at the same address and then go down that path. And if not, they have to go into the nested repeat loop. Um, there is not an easy way to copy and paste the first child's address into the others. Um, other than using logic that if if all lived at same first address equals true, set a uh, child city TE to whatever that is, that address is. And then you can add on to that if there are different addresses further down the line of the children. Okay, again, this is a complicated topic. I'm very happy to talk with you about it. Um, it gets me every time I have to do it and I spend all day every day in A to J. Um, so totally understand if you have questions or if you wanna go through this again. I'll get the recording up on YouTube as soon as possible. And I will see you all again in September. Thank you.